Desert Immigrants by Mario T. Garcia, Chapter 4. Obreros y Comerciantes. The commercial semi industrial character of El Paso's economy largely determined the types of jobs Mexicans obtained requiring highly largely determined the types of jobs Mexicans obtained requiring large numbers of manual workers employers hired Mexicans between 1880 and 1920 the economy became dependent on the Mexican obreros the workers their significant numbers alone formed the labor based base upon which the city development rested as one scholar likewise noted notes of southern black immigration black migration into Ch chicago during the early 20th century immigration produced mexican pro proliterate in el paso mexicans in both unskilled and some skilled jobs could be found in every major economic activity transportation smelting industry the retail trade, construction, and a variety of services. Some have said that half of the population of El Paso is Mexican, wrote an American. And if that is not quite true, it is because the rest cannot possibly edge in. According to the writer, El Paso's greatest asset lay in its Mexican population, which could be used to develop numerous industries. And with such mass of good, faithful, and speedily efficient labor at your door and within your border, the, this astute observer concluded it is a sad neglect of a golden opportunity not to hasten to provide the employment that will make of that labor ample consumers of home pro products. <clears throat> El Paso Enterprise recognized the economic benefits to be derived from the city's pool of Mexican labor. The El Paso smelter, for example, employed more Mexicans than any other firm. City directory listings show that between 1900 and 1910, the number of Spanish surnamed smelter workers went from 811, 84% of total, to 1,017, 90% of the total. 10 years later, the 1920 directory recorded a slight decrease in Spanish surnamed workers at the smelter. Although they still formed a substantial majority of 917 employees, 768 or 87% had Spanish surnames. Although the city resulted from lower population, I'm sorry, lower production, after World War I, besides their large numbers, it appears that the smelter employed the Mexican chiefly, Mexicans chiefly as manual laborers. Most Mexican smelter employees listed in El Paso War, World War I draft records worked as laborers. In contrast, Americans monopolized the limited skilled occupations in this labor-intensive industry. The smelter paid the Mexican wage that ranged from a dollar to a dollar a day in 1902 to a dollar fifty a day in 1914. The average salary for American workers cannot be determined, but wages for skilled workers in El Paso in 1911 ranged from three dollars and fifty cents to six dollars a day. For their pay, the Mexican wor worked twelve-hour days until 1914 when the company began three eight-hour shifts. Since El Paso, quote, blue laws did not affect the, the smelter because of its location just outside the city limits, many of the Mexican workers also labored on Sundays. In El Paso, the railroads hired not only thousands of Mexican Mexicans for work throughout the Southwest, but also many for their shops in the border city. While the 1900 city directory had listed only 29 Spanish surnamed employees of the railroads out of 834, 20 years later, it had counted 1,010 Spanish surnames, 
or 37% of 2,753 railroad workers. Many of these remained in El Paso and worked in the shops. Although the largest number of Mexicans were manual laborers, the railroads utilized some in numerous other capacities, as Table 4.1 shows. The railroad's need for skilled and semi-skilled workers, plus the large number of Mexicans allowed a minority to be trained as machinists, machinist helpers, bolt makers, car repairmen, and trucks. A small number held clerical and for foreman positions, presumably over the Mexi other Mexicans. Charles Almejillo, who arrived in 1910 at the age of 30, found employment as a Pullman conductor due to his high level of education than most other immigrants. I ran here between, or I ran between here, El Paso and Los Angeles, between here and Albuquerque in several places, he recalled. They used to switch me around, Cleof, unquote, Cleophus Caleros, who began work for the Santa Fe line in 1912 as a messenger boy, advanced to a chief line clerk 14 years later. Calleras remembered, however, that Mexicans rarely could be found in the offices. Almost no. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and show the chart so that you can take a look at the person's Spanish surnames. Almost no Mexicans, moreover, held sorry, held the few engineering and managerial jobs because these occupations remained in American hands. In a report for the Department of Labor in 1908, one federal official outlined what he believed were characteristics making the Mexican attractive to railroads. As a labor, the... Mexicans immigrant is said to be unambitious, physically not strong, and somewhat indolent, sick, and regular, irregular, he wrote. But against this is put the fact that he is docile, patient, orderly in camp, fairly intelligent under the competent supervision, obedient, and cheap. His strongest point with the employers, is his willingness to work for a low wage. That same year, the Times pointed out that owing to the national turn downturn in the economy, the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad had reduced the pay of the laborers in El Paso to 10 cents an hour. Many of the men employed, the paper observed, who for the most part our Mexicans are greatly dissatisfied, and there was considerable talk of their quitting. None of them, however, quit Saturday night, and it is thought that in view of the scarcity of work, that few, if any, will leave, quote, unquote. The cheapness of Mexican workers and their ability to be used in unskilled, semi-skilled, and even skilled occupations made them attractive to employees. For the railroad shops, lines such as the Southwestern and the GH and SA, for example, hired large percentages of Mexican workers in both their machine shops and roundhouses. One old-time resident who worked as a downtown store clerk remembers seeing many Mexicans employees of the Southern Pacific and other railroads going to lunch with their greasy overalls and caps. Because of the building boom in El Paso, construction companies depended heavily on Mexican workers, especially for common labor. The Lone Star reported in 1885 that the boom had provided jobs for large numbers of laborers. In addition to business and home construction, Mexican workers as laborers for the building of the streetcar system and for such firms as the S asphaltite and by thule thick companies betula thick companies sorry if i mispronounced which paved many of the city streets 
One federal official remarked that Los Angeles and San Antonio contractors also employed Mexicans for street grading. In 1908, San Antonio Mexican worker, street workers received wages of $1.25 and $1.50 a day. Some of El Paso's buildings builders utilized the services of labor contractor R.G. Gonzalez, who advertised in 1912 that he could pre predominantly promptly supply the construction firms with laborers. Moreover, construction accident reports um, the, in the newspapers often involved Mexicans such as one in 1904 on Overland Street that injured several Mexican workers. Other industries employing Mexicans include, included the El Paso Milling Company, with 90 Spanish surnamed employees and a work force of 119 in 1917. The Dar Derbyshire Harvey Iron and Machine Company listed 113 Spanish surnames out of 129 workers that same year. Finally, in 1917, the El Paso Brass Foundry had 28 employees, 18 with Spanish surnames. While the, most of these firms hired Mexicans as manual laborers, some taught a minority particular skills or hired Mexican craftsmen who might had migrated to the border. This became necessarily not only because Mexican workers for lower wages, but also because <clears throat> it was difficult to recruit American skilled workers to El Paso and the rest of the Southwest. In 1905, the Times noted that a lack of plasterers, brick masons, and carpenters had delayed construction of the Union Station for the railroads. According to the newspaper, I'm sorry, the unavailable, unavailability of craftsmen had become a problem throughout the city. In order to alleviate this condition, employers began using Mexicans in, the, in these positions. Still other concerns hired Mexicans who had specific skills such as boilermakers and pressmen. One sample of occupational distribution of El Paso by surname reveals that Mexicans employed as skill, skilled workers in 1920 represented 10.5% of Mexican workers. The Kohlberg Cigar Factory, produced of La International Cigars, hired a large percentage of skilled Mexican workers. Founded in 1886 by a German-Jewish immigrant, the plant from its start employed Mexican and some Cuban cigar makers originally located on El Paso Street. It moved to a new building at Santa Fe and Second Streets in 1911 that the Times called one of the best equipped and mo most modern cigar factories in the Southwest. On the second floor of the factory, Workers rolled the cigars, turning out an average of $15,000 per day. One of the features such as of such activity involved an old cigar maker's custom. While the men worked, one read, read aloud newspapers and books as a form of education and entertainment for the workers. Several other cigar factories also operated in El Paso for short periods, but the Kohlberg firm remained the largest and best known. In 1917, it had 113 employees, 110 with Spanish surnames. Mexicans, one Mexican whose father came to El Paso in 1910, recalled that his father had worked for Law International after having been a cigar worker in Puebla, Veracruz, Havana, and Tampa. Besides being employed in industries, many Mexicans were hired by El Paso merchants. The need for Spanish-speaking clerks arose because of the significant numbers of Mexican consumers from both sides of the border who patronized the, the local stores. Consequently, the sign of Se Habla Español, We Speak Spanish, became a common sight throughout the downtown shopping district. Once ads in the newspapers often appeared reading 
Help wanted four neat Spanish salesmen that can deliver the goods. No others need apply. Ask for Mr. Pat Ochoa, room five Stevens building, unquote. In 1916, one of the largest dry goods stores, the popular employed nearly 100 Mexicans, half its employees. The founder of the popular Adolf Schwartz Early had recognized that if he wanted to prosper in El Paso, he had to learn Spanish. Many of the popular's more important customers included numerous Mexicans, presumably wealthy ones from Chihuahua, who often stopped to chat with Schwartz in his office. His knowledge of Spanish, unquote, one study notes, Schwartz, quote, helped, had helped him to attract and maintain this clientele. Furthermore, his use of Mexican clerks helped in sales to the Mexican shoppers. A 1920 popular ad in the Spanish language La Patria emphasized that all store departments had Spanish-speaking personnel. Quote, we have 26 years experience, the ad boasted, of good treatment of Mexican customers, unquote. Besides prominent stores such as the popular Mexican clerks worked in a variety of smaller ones owned by both Americans, mostly Jewish, and Mexican merchants. One former clerk recalls that he first worked in a store in El pa South El Paso Street called La Buena Sierra, the good luck. As a salesman, he received $6 a week, a wage comparable to that of a laborer. In a in a few cases, some Mexicans, such as Francisco J. Mace, I'm sorry, who sold sewing machines for the Singer Company, worked as salesmen for national firms. For two generations, he, Mace, was a, a familiar sight on El Paso streets, unquote. Wrote Calleras, longtime resident and historian, quote, his buggy with a sewing machine strapped to the 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 back was everywhere unquote the extent of Mex of the mexican clerical force can be seen in one study which calculates the percentage of spanish surnames in low white collar i'm sorry oh, low white collar occupations rose from 12.0% in 1910 to 19.8% 10 years later as an indication of this growth, 75 Mexican clerks in 1913 organized the International Clerks Protective Association with 191 Mexican members. Mexicans also worked in addition, additional businesses, establishments as teamsters, waiters, cooks, dishwashers, and janitors. The Mills Building in downtown El Paso, for example, employed a Mexican as an extra elevator operator for 20 cents an hour. Others found jobs as janitors with the city public schools. Some Mexicans, such as Juan Baca, became self-employed. He owned a carriage and transformed goods between Ciudad Juarez and El Paso for $3 to $5 a day. Crispy Fox, longtime El Paso resident, remembered that some Mexican op operated express wagons called ex expresitos hauling furniture and other items for different stores according to fox the mexicans quote could load more furniture on one of those little old wagons that you can in a van today in the early 1880s the lone star noted el paso's dependence on mexican fruit and vegetable hucksters who regularly crossed the border to sell their products the paper further observed that Mexican ice cream vendors are numerous, unquote. The Times reported in 1913 that a group of Mexican workers as individual garbage men hauling trash on their wagons from the American North Side to the to their homes in Chihuahua, Ch I'm sorry, Ch Chihuahita, where city sanitation wagons picked up the load. Moreover, by 1915, a few Mexicans made a living as jitney drivers, 
although this involved them in a controversy with the El Paso Electric Railway Company facing competition from the Jitneys in, the, in a patriotic letter, quote, to our fellow El Pasoans, a streetcar company, company attacked the Mexicans. It appealed to anti-alien sentiments, sentiments by emphasizing that Mexican refugees owned many of the Jitneys. Consequently, the streetcar officials argued that the Mexican represented transients who would take their money with them when they left. The streetcar company pointed out that the Jitneys charged 10 cents double a streetcar ride and that while American operators were clean and courteous, the Mexicans were not. Quote, take many of the Jitney drivers the company charged and, quote, and you will see them collarless, shirt-sleeved, their clothing greasy from their, from the oil of their... Sorry. <clears throat> oil machines a cigarette between their lips the smoke blown into the faces of passengers is this courtesy unquote a supporter of the streetcar streetcars in a letter to the herald asked quote who are the jitney drivers can they read and speak english if a sign ahead should read stop real danger ahead can the jitney driver read it quickly unquote in addition to private employees employers public agendas employed mexicans in 1886 the city council paid three dollars to certain mexicans for cut, cutting brush on the sewer system survey line three years later the council minutes recorded a total of $12 to 10 Mexican laborers for street maintenance. The city further employed Mexicans at a dollar a day per for park work. Besides using Mexicans for common labor, officials hired them for cooking in the pest house and city jail. In their wa wagons, Mexicans often hauled patients to the pest house or hospital. Furthermore, the city's major scavenger job, unquote, head of the sanitation department, <coughs> excuse me, was a Mexican patronage position that the Democratic ring bestowed on loyal Mexican-American politicians, ma politician who helped deliver the Mexican vote. Frank Aldorete, who with his brother Ike, headed the Mexican, headed the ring's Mexican faction held the job for part of the period, and employed Mexicans for the city. In a letter to the city council in 1908, Mayor Joseph Sweeney praised Alderete's ability, quote, I think, unquote, Sweeney wrote, quote, the sanitary commissioner, Mr. Alderete, is entitled to your thanks and that of every citizen in El Paso for the efficient and capable department he has established, unquote. In 1912, more than 100 Mexican employees of the city, many apparently American citizens, organized a political club called the Seculo de Amigos and struck a bargain with the city not to hire any laborers except club members. Public utility companies such as the El Paso Water Company also employed Mexican common laborers. Although the Mexicans worked long and hard hours, one utility official believed they sought any excuse not to work. Quote, when a Mexican laborer wants to take a day off, claimed Superintendent H. W. H. Watts of the water company, <clears throat> sick, what saint's day he was celebrating Lewis said the man was not celebrating any saint today, but was celebrating the anniversary of the burning of, a, of his house, that he was remaining home today to prevent fire from repeating the performance. Next, they will be celebrating the anniversary of the death of some pet dog or burro. Not all Mexicans found public employment job as laborers, some often for political favors acquired positions on the police force, the 1890 
payroll of city employees include Santiago Alvarado, who received $60 a month as the sole Mexican police officer in a 12-man department. Earlier that year, lawyer O. A. Lare, 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 Zolo, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, had presented the city council a petition on behalf of Alvarado and another Mexican policeman. It noted that both men received smaller wages compared to American officers of similar rank. For their services, the Mexicans requested a wage of $75 a month. Although the council appear, apparently did not approve the salary increase, sorry, its minutes reveal that another Mexican police officer received $75 a month in 1894. Two years later, five Mexican officers worked on a 16-man police force. These Mexican policemen served as street patrolmen, mounted policemen, and special officers. During the next several years, the city hired additional Mexican policemen. But surprisingly, by 1918, only three were listed out of the 90 men of, in the police department. The decline may have resulted from increased racial tensions and heightened pre prejudice in the city due to the Mexican Revolution. And the fear of the war of war with Mexico, besides being a minority on the police force, Mexican officers received beats in Chihuahita, but rarely in the Me American sections of the city. A policeman from 1901 to 1905 Ramon Gonzalez, years later, recalled that his own beat included the corner of Utah Street, now Mesa Avenue, the third street on the south side, from where he could keep an eye on the red light district, officially sanctioned by the city. Besides the police force, Mexicans received other types of public appointments. Mexicans in El Paso represented a major political asset to the D democratic ring which controlled the city and county governments throughout most of the period of the period although most mexicans did not possess american citizenship the ring literally voted their mexicans ensuring ex itself a, a victory over reform democrats and A weak Republican Party, as part of the process, the ring rewarded Mexican-American politicos such as Ike Aldreta, who served as the district clerk until he fell into political disfavor with the ring. The record for political longevity, however, went to Crispiano Ar Aranato, Arnada, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, better known as Chris Ar Aranda who was deputy county clerk for 42 years. <coughs> Excuse me. When Arna Aranda died in 1930, an El Paso newspaper or, uh, eulogized that his death ended one of the most remarkable public careers in the county's history. Next to him, J.A. Eskett. Escajito stood as the staunchest Mexican-American supporter of the ring. He held a variety of offices, including district clerk from 1887 to 1931. The ring also appointed or elected Mexican-Americans as county commissioners, justices of the peace, and constables. Despite this patronage, the ring never supported any Mexican-American for a major political position such as mayor or county judge and Mexican-Americans did not play a significant role in the decision-making procedures of the Democratic Party. While the city and county governments provided most public employment for Mexicans, some managed to receive federal appointments as well. Pedro Candelera, for example, held a job as distribu distributing clerk in 1896. At the El Paso Post Office, and according to historian Calares, Pete was a faithful servant in the community. Pillar A. Mace 
entered the postal service in the 1880s and became an assistant postmaster in 1901. The Times noted that J.M. Garcia worked as a U.S. Customs inspector, and a year later the paper reported that Antonio Sierra had been named official and interpreter at the El Paso Bureau of Immigration. The Times also carried a story in 1904 about one of the first Amer Mexicans to hold a federal job. Cristobal Bacela, 102 years old, the paper stated, and who came to El Paso 60 years ago, once a pension, he worked for the government many years ago and is now too old to earn a living. A sample of the 393 El Paso households from, nine, from the 1900 manuscript census reveals that almost one-fifth, 17.11% of Mexican households containing, contained a working woman. American women also had to enter the labor force, and the census sample recorded 11.21% of American households with a female worker. Mexican women who worked, according to the census samples, were unmarried daughters, wives with no husbands or single women. Married Mexican women, on the other hand, both foreign and native-born, within a nuclear or an extended family, did not work outside the home. In no case the in the sample did a woman with an employed husband have a job, both because the census and city directories failed to count many Mexicans. It may well be that a large larger percentage of Mexican women, including married ones, worked especially at part-time labor and laundry or sewing. In any event, fewer married women appear to have had jobs than unmarried ones. Age and fertility had helped explain the condition in the 1900 sample. More than three-fourths of married Mexican immigrant women were between 15 and 40 years of age, a period when women generally gave birth and had children at home. Indeed, more than three-fourths of all married Mexican immigrant women in El Paso, based on the sample, had children 12 years of age or under listed as attending school. Of these, more than one-third had children five years of age and under. If having children kept married women in the home, so too apparently did the attitude of many Mexican men who resented women, especially wives working or wanting to work. Most males believed that their work was a man's duty, but that women's consisted of raising children and keeping house. As one work class, working class newspaper in Mexico during the age of Purifero Diaz emphasized, to be a wife is to be a woman preferably selected amongst many other women for her honesty, for her religiousness, for her amiability, for her industriousness, and for her docility, unquote. United States did not remain static. Over the years, more Mexican women, especially daughters, became wage workers to augment to fa the family income. Also, as the economy expanded, El Paso and Southwestern Industries and Services began to recruit more Mexican women workers. The increase in Mexican female wage workers in El Paso by 1920 can be seen in the in census figures that for that year. The census reported that 3,474 foreign-born females, almost all Mexicans, 10 years of age and older, were engaged in gainful occupations. Foreign-born female wage workers represented half of all females, 10 years and over, who held jobs in El Paso. Most female workers in El Paso, 3,112 females, or 45% of all employed women, did women's work. The two largest com 
occupations familiar to women in Mexico were servants, 1,718, and laundresses, 710, where the majority of Mexican working women could be found. Owing to deficiencies in school skills and schooling, as well as prejudice against them, few Mexican women, unlike their American counterparts, were in such skilled professional occupations as teaching, nursing, or office work. Table 4.2 shows the number of and percentage of Spanish surnamed women listed as domestics <clears throat> and laundresses in the city directories of 1889, 1910, and 1920. Victor S. Clark, a Bureau of Labor inspector, noted in 1908 that Mexican, quote, immigrant women have so little conception of domestic arrangements in the United States that the task of training them would be too heavy for American housewives, yet domestic work, proved to be the most readily available source of jobs for Mexican women. Still, Clark's correctly recognized that women can, from predominant pre-industrial cultures, might have difficulty adjusting to the new electrical devices of middle-class American homes. Although he failed un to understand that the employment of Mexican maids saved Southwestern housewives from having to buy the new appliances, Mexican domestics did their work by hand. Elizabeth Ray Tyson, who grew up in El Paso, remembered the existence of Mexican maids used by American families. Owing to the large Mex Mexican majority, she recalled, almost every Anglo-American had family had at least one, sometimes two or three servants, a maid and laundress and perhaps a nursemaid or yardman. The maid came in after breakfast and cleaned up the breakfast dishes and very likely last night's supper dishes as well. Did the routine cleaning, washing and ironing and after the family dinner in the middle of the day, wash dishes again and then went home to perform similar service in her own home. An examination of the city directories listing both homes and work <clears throat> addresses indicates that the Mexican maids left their homes in the barrios in the morning to work in American neighborhoods during the day and then returned in the afternoon or evening to the Mexican district. <clears throat> in some cases, Mexican domesticates had living quarters with their employers. Our newspaper account reported that the hours of house girls, unquote, went from seven in the morning to five in the afternoon. And in 1907, they received from three to six dollars per week for this. Most apparently were hired by American middle class families. Mexican women, besides working as servants, found other employment opportunities. Many worked as washerwomen, either in American homes or in their own, as well as in the various laundries of El Paso. In laundries, they learned such skills as the use of sewing machines and received from $4 to $6 per week a week in 1917. The largest in the city, the El Paso Laundry employed 134 Spanish surnamed workers out of a total of 166 and Mexican women mostly doing collar and flat work comprised what appears to have been more than half the Mexican employees. That same year, the elite laundry had 76 Spanish surnamed female workers out of a total of 128. Another of the larger laundries, the Acme employed 75 Spanish surnamed females out of 121 employees. In 1917, the same pattern prevailed in the smaller laundries. For example, the post laundry had 33 Spanish surnamed women in their workforce. I'm sorry. 
of 49. This book's hard to hold. I'm sorry, guys. While many of these laundresses lived in El Paso, some came from Ciudad Juarez, the daughter-in-law of Frank Fletcher, who owned the Acme Laundry, remembers that when she arrived in 1926, a laundry truck picked up the Mexican women at the border, took them to work, and returned them in the evening to the International Bridge. The use of non-resident Mexican women limited already low wages. In addition to service jobs, some Mexican women labored as production workers, <clears throat> especially in El Paso's early garment factories. In 1902, Bergman's factory, which turned out shirts and overalls, reported that it had three American women and a large number of Mexican females. Yet, according to a newspaper account, Bergman concluded that he could get more and better work out of his American Americans and consequently paid them 10 to 14 dollars a week while the mexicans received no more than nine dollars a week several years later in 1919 the el paso overall company advertised in a spanish language newspaper that it needed mexican women for sewing and for general work mexican women likewise worked for worked in the Kohlberg cigar factory mostly Boxing cigars, 22 Mexican women out of 113 employees labored in the plant in 1917. Some women also found jobs as clerk, clerks and sales personnel in the downtown stores. A Times ad in 1905 wanted, quote, wanted five experienced American and Spanish sales ladies, unquote. The Mexican newspaper El Dia in 1919 praised the Panchita Salas for her work and charm, unquote, at the El Globo department store run by the Schwartz family. That same year, the White House department store, one of El Paso's largest publicized in La Patria, that it needed young work, young women clerks in all its departments. Still other Mexicans worked as cooks or dishwashers in restaurants. In more unfortunate cases, Mexican women sold food on the streets of Chihuahita. Finally, as in other societies, some women inhabited the saloons and gambling halls of the red light district. The Lone Star in 1885 expressed shock over a 12-year-old Mexican girl's activities. Quote, it is rumored, unquote, the newspaper sermonized, quote, that she is a prostitute and most any hour of the day she can be seen on in the streets with different men unquote. when city government enforced an ordinance in 1903 to move the district farther from the center of el paso the times reported that many of the prostitutes proposed to go across the river among the number of being mexicans <coughs> excuse me which included the dance hall girls. Two years later, when Lou Vidal attempted to open his dance hall, police raided and arrested his employees, which included dance hall girls, Maria Gonzalez, Josefia Gonzalez, Lola Beltran, and Senida Garcia. While men and women formed the bulk of the Mexican workers in El Paso, many children between 10 and 15 had to find jobs to help their families. Although it is difficult to calculate their exact numbers, Guillermo Balderas, whose family arrived in 1910, recalls that most Mexican boys worked after completion of the sixth grade. Some, such as Agustin Romero, labored in the railroad yards. He had a job as an oil boy at the GH and SA Roundhouse when he accused in 1908 of assault against the son of a railroad laborer. Others sold newspapers, shined, shined shoes on El Paso streets, or delivered packages for merchants. Some worked as water boys at the El Paso smelter. In 1914, George Harper, the city sanitary commissioner, noted that some Americans paid Mexican boys 25 cents to cart off garbage from their backyards 
Mexican girls also worked and included among the large numbers of servants who could be found girls in the early teens. Although most Mexicans in El Paso were workers, there did, did develop an active business sector, Comercientes, servicing the Mexican population. It appeared that among the immigrants, as well as among Mexican Americans, some had sufficient capital to operate small scale enterprises. Moreover, wealthier political refugees invested in El Paso businesses after 1910. The majority of these establishments, however, tended to be small service oriented and located in the Mexican barrio of Chihuahita. Consequently, Mexican businessmen functioned separately from the general business community between 1900 and 1920. Only a handful of Spanish surnames appeared on the membership rolls of the Chamber of Commerce. The Retail Merchants League, <clears throat> organized in 1910, contained no Mexican members and the Retail Grocers Association had only one Mexican participant. Advertisements in the Spanish language newspapers of El Paso called attention to the variety of Mexican business businesses in the city. These included restaurants, general stores, tailors, photographers, bakeries, labor contractors, laundries, clothing stores, bookstores, meat markets, entrepreneurs, interpreters, and translators, real estate salesmen, watchmakers, furniture stores, I'm sorry, drug stores, saloons, and money lenders. The Caladrian brothers ad in La Patilla in 1919 showed the Mexicans new material tastes in that they sold phonographs and records, including the most popular tunes for dancing, unquote. One of the largest Mexican stores of the Caldrean brothers incorporated for $50,000 in 1916 and sold stock at $10 a share. Finally, ads appeared for Mexican silent movie houses on South Apaso Street, such as the Tieta Aca. Alcazar, at the Teatro Iris, and the Teatro Hidalgo. These theaters belong to the International Pictures Company, headed by J. de la C. Alcaran of El Paso. People laughed at me and said my ideas were crazy when I entered the movie moving pictures field here six years ago, unquote. Alcaran stated in an interview, but I succeeded and I am far more certain of success in my new and bigger undertaking. Alcaran uh, had been a printer and newspaper man in Ciudad Juarez with little money when he crossed the border in 1913 and entered the theater business. In a short time, he had prospered and, in 1919, operated six theaters in El Paso, two in Juarez, and four in Chihuahua, besides officers in New York and Mexico City, distributing American films throughout Mexico, and appealing characteristics of these Mexican establishments, was their use of, a, of colorful store names. They symbolized not only cultural traditions, but also a nationalistic and ethnic consciousness among Mexicans in El Paso. Besides those already mentioned, Mexican stores had such names as Cantino El Palicia, La Preta del Sol, La Estrella, Cantana, El Toro, Las Tres Piedras, La Perla, La Azteca, Agencia, Hispano American. Gran Photographs Mexicans and Carnicero Mexicana. At times, these titles expressed more than just a cultural and nationalist <clears throat> settlement sentiment. The, Mex the magnificent success obtained by many newspaper La Patria boasted editor Sylvester Teresa's before the ad club of El Paso in 1920. 
quote, is largely due to its name, its motto, and the engraving you see in these cards. With national colors, my travel agent, traveling agents, especially in New Mexico and Arizona, tell me that cards like these with pictures of Father Hidalgo advertising La Patria, the fatherland, are being displayed in nearly every home. Besides aiding business sales, newspaper advertising led to an important Spanish language press in El Paso between 1890 and 1920. More than 20 Mexican daily and weekly newspapers appeared in the border city. Some, like Sancho Panza, published in 1891, only had a brief tenure, while others, such as La Pretea, operated for several years. Although each newspaper possessed a particular ideological perspective, many represented commercial enterprises rather than political organizations. In addition to local, national, and international news, Along with literary sections, the Spanish language press carried numerous advertisements by both Mexican and American merchants. Publishers stressed that business, businesses would increase their sales and profits if they advertised in the Mexican press. El Hispano Americano in 1893 pointed out that the intelligent and enlightened Spanish pub reading public, unquote, of the Southwest read El Paso's cheapest and only Spanish daily on both frontiers. Consequently, it informed American manufacturers that the Mexicans' population constituted a large consuming market. To assist American merchants, El Hispano Americano translated all advertisements free of charge. Here is a new field for the manufacturer and businessmen to increase businesses and profits. The Mexican paper included, concluded, impressed by these arguments, a number of corporations brought, bought space is in Mexican newspapers in El Paso and throughout the Southwest that these firms had found a new consumer in the Mexicans can be seen in an ad by the Sears Roebuck and Company, published in El Correo del Bravo in 1913. Atención Mexican, Mexicanos, the notice appealed to Mexican customers <clears throat> with the objective of making it more convenient for our Mexican friends in the United States <clears throat> to buy our merchandise, unquote, Sears announced. We have just established a special department to attend all requests made in the Spanish language. The ability of Sylvester Tareses, who had arrived as a political refugee and other Mexican publishers, to acquire extensive advertising made El Paso's Mexican press among the most widely circulated Spanish language newspapers in the Southwest and Northern Mexico. For example, in addition to agents north of the border, Teresa's employed a Chihuahua advertising manager for the La, for La Patria's international editions, which according to Teresa's further commercial relations between the United States and Mexico. The Mexican press of El Paso through its national and local advertisements influenced Mexican buying habits and mediated the immigrants' acceptance of American business and consumer values. As, a, as further indication of the growth of Mexican businesses, the city directory of 1900 had listed only three Spanish surnamed barbers, yet 20 years later, El Paso had 57 bar barber shops run by Mexicans. A similar increase involved the Spanish surnamed boot and shoemakers, whose shops grew from eight, to eight in 1900 to 56 in 1920. Moreover, the number of Spanish surnamed retail grocers listed by the directory rose from 19 in 1900 to 446 in 1920. One year earlier, the Times reported that El, Paso, El Paso's Mexican grocers had organized a Spanish-speaking retail grocers association with 129 members. Although the spread of grocers, grocery stores was significant, most remained small and operated out of the Mexican homes 
Some grocers also had to work as laborers to make a living. Despite the number of Barrios stores, few Mexicans could be found in more lucrative and established businesses occupations. The city directory of 1920 listed no more, no Mexican advertising agencies, no Mexican auto dealers, no Mexican gas stations, five Mexican contractors out of a total of 101 and only seven Spanish surnamed real estate and land agents out of 92. In addition, the retail apparel and dry goods stores owned by Mexicans could not compare to large department stores such as the Popular and the White House. Limited in capital and located only in the Mexican districts, Mexican businesses remained dependent on the small wages and basic needs of immigrants. One major exception was Felix Martinez, the prominent Mexican in El Paso. Unlike most of Mexicans, however, Martinez had been born and educated in New Mexico, at Las Vegas, he had published a democratic newspaper, La Voz del Pueblo, besides owning considerable property. According to one account, Martinez had lost most of his money in politics by the time he moved to El Paso in 1897, yet he must have retained some funds, for on his arrival, El Monitor noted that Martinez had acquired a real estate office, a notary public service, a hotel, and various other properties impressed. El Monitor believed that the Mexican community of El Paso would gain from pre the presence of such a distinguished man as Martinez, a gentleman in honor, fa fame, and of charitable feelings, from his arrival to his death in 1916, at the age of 58, Martinez accumulated what appears to have been a significant amount of wealth. He owned or had interest in Martina, in the Martinez Publishing Company, the El Paso Juarez R Railway Company, the International Real Estate Office, and Central Brokerage Firm, the Southwestern Portland cement company the central building and improvement company the east el paso town company and the international water company martinez also held substantial property investments throughout the city when a reporter inquired of one of martinez's daughters in 1963 if she knew the entire business activities of her father she said she replied it's hard to say they were extensive and he was in many business ventures with his friends. I really don't know what his dealings were. Unquote. Not restricting himself to business, Martinez served on the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce and as president of the El Paso Fair Association. Promoting the city, the chamber also appointed Don Felix, unquote, to its committee on lands and irrigation, which assisted in the construction of Elephant Butte Dam in southern New Mexico. Because he was involved in democratic politics, many regarded him as a po major political figure in El Paso. His political as well as economic and civic influence led to his selection by President Woodrow Wilson in 1915 as chairman of the United States Commission to South America and to the Panama Pacific International Exposition held that year in San Francisco. Prior to this appointment, Wilson had named Martinez a director of the Federal Reserve Bank for the bank's 11th district covering Texas. At his death, mourners include, included important El Paso as well as Chihuahua officials who had in their top silk hats and fine suits paid final respects as the body lay in the street, or I'm sorry, lay in the state in the Chamber of Commerce for two days under police guard. Unlike businessmen who played a significant role because they catered to the essential needs of the Mexican population, few professionals were found in the barrios due to the poverty of the people and the lack of educational opportunities. In 1900, the city directory listed 50 dentists and physicians. Only one had Spanish surname. 
20 years later, out of 182 dentists and physicians, 11 had Spanish surnames. Some Mexican physicians practiced in El Paso only because they had fled as political refugees from the Mexican Revolution. Dr. M. N. Samuningo, for example, not only represented the small number of Mexican professionals, but was <clears throat> one of the first dentists in the city with his office in El on El Paso Street in 1895. Dr. Juan C. Ricci, however, was the most highly respected Mexican physician during the early years and specialized in infirmities, infirmities del pulmon, pulmonary disease. Ricci held a variety of medical positions in Mexico before he came to El Paso and had traveled in both the United States and Europe. From his office in Chihuahita, Ricci treated numerous Mexican patients from El Paso to and Chihuahua and twice a week administered vaccine shots to children charging 50 cents for each child but at no cost to the poor. Mexicans also utilized the services of Dr. Antonio de la Campa, who had an office near Ch Chihuahita in 1897. That same year, El Charan del Norte carried a notice for Dr. Santiago Gonzalez, specializing in heart and blood disease. Ten years later, Professor S.A. Arieta advertised his practice in the Herald. Arieta emphasized that he had been trained by a European specialist, had 16 years experience in Mexican Mexico hospitals, and excelled in Swedish, German, English, and French messages messages. Lawyers and other professionals were also scar were as scarce as physicians. Some Mexicans in El Paso of 39 attorneys in the 1900 city directory, no Spanish surname appeared and in the 1920 directory, only nine Spanish surname lawyers were listed out of 165. Re Reginaldo Venezuela one of the new Mexican attorneys advertised in 1897 that he practiced law in both Texas and New Mexico. I speak perfect English, he informed Mexican readers of El Monitor. Other professionals who placed ads in the newspapers included Janero Ramonet, offering his services as a mining engineer. T.C. Venezuela teaching English and Spanish in a school located in the Central Hotel, and Jose de la Luz Venzel giving music lessons in the violin and mandolin in his home. Whether as workers, merchants, or professionals, Mexican immigrants were occupationally and economically restricted by El Paso's economy which steamed, which stressed labor-intensive enterprises requiring mostly cheap manual labor. Still, Mexican workers, male and female, proved essential to the city's economic growth. Mexican labor changed the face of El Paso. Easily accessi accessibility to jobs, moreover, aided the immigrants' own economic and cultural adjustment. Mexicans, although exploited in their work, tolerated hardworking and living conditions because at least they had jobs. Whereas few existed south of the border, nevertheless, the relationship between obreros and employers formed a class structure that maintained the material advantages and social privileges that American bosses derived from a large pool of cheap Mexican labor. This is the end of chapter four. Thank you.